It's October 1992, and boys to men are taking their smooth R&B harmonies to the end of the road. This was also the month when Sinead O'Connor ripped up a picture of the Pope on Saturday Night Live, the Cartoon Network premiered on cable TV, the world completely ignored the release of Reservoir Dogs, H. Ross Perot re-entered the presidential race, and Steven Seagal's only good movie dominated at the box office. But I don't have no time for you to be playing my heart like this because this was also the month when diehard game fan first hit newsstands across the country. Hello, my name is Cyril, and this is the debut episode of Die Hard Game Fan's Best and Worst. Over the course of 88 episodes, we're going to be counting down every issue's best and worst review, no matter if they only cover 5 games or all the way up to 36. And that's not all, because each episode is going to be filled with comedy bits, crazy quotes, and a regular update on the Monitor Game Fan's official mascot. This is the ultimate show about the ultimate 1990s video game magazine. Join me as I count down Die Hard Game Fan's top 36 games of October 1992. Tonight, police race to the scene when a man is pinned beneath a train. How many people in your office really like your copier? Well, you could hire a whole new staff. Sex went on sale today around the world for $50. I was not put on a ballot by either of the two parties. All right, starting out our list, number 36 is Predator 2 on the Genesis. Take Smash TV and give yourself the freedom to move around and you've got Predator 2. Well, not a bad game, I found it a little too average from beginning to end. The best part was watching the hostages get toasted. Number 35, Green Dog on the Genesis. Green Dog could have been a really great side-scrolling action game, but falls short in the graphics and sound categories. A surfer as a lead character is a great idea, but I feel the end result is average at best. Number 34, Super Buster Bros on the Super Nintendo. How long can you run around popping bubbles, and how fun can that be? Even though the graphics are Capcom quality, I couldn't get into this one. But if it's your kind of game, I'm sure it's the best one. After all, it is Capcom. Number 33, New Adventure Island on the Turbo Duo. Adventure Island is your typical run-and-gun action type game. While I can't really beg on the title, I found it pretty much average all around. It's nice to see on the Turbo, but I'd like to see a little more originality. So-so. Number 32, Shapeshifter on the Turbo Duo. I'm one of those people that held on to my Turbo CD, and it's nice to see that it was worth it. Not that Shapeshifter is a great game, but it held my interest. I especially liked the scrolling and diversity of characters. Now that I've dusted off my system, keep them coming! Number 31, King of the Monsters on the Super Nintendo. It's great that Super Nintendo owners can play Neo Geo games, and King of the Monsters plays okay on the Super Nintendo. But it's not the Neo Geo. Maybe they should have called it King of the Monsters Jr. Number 30, Prince of Persia on the Turbo Duo. Yet another version, this time on the Super CD. While not a bad game at all, I was expecting a little more, especially in the sound category. Good animation and challenge make it above average and a nice action title for the Turbo Duo CD-ROM. Number 29, Parodius on the Super Nintendo. I'm sorry, I just don't like cute games. I know, I know, this is a great Konami shooter with great colors and a lot of bosses. But man, is it cute. I'll pass. Number 28, Harley's Humongous Adventure on the Super Nintendo. Harley's is a fun game with a great diversity, but what makes it really stand out are the claymation effects, especially on the Bug Rat boss. Harley's is a good challenge, and it's plenty long. More scrolls and backgrounds would have put it in the 90s. Number 27, Super High Impact on the Genesis. I'm not big on sports games, but I really liked High Impact. It's got easy controls, great voices, and no ice skating characters. This is as much an action game as it is a sports game. 
those iguanas really know what they're doing. Number 26, Dead Moon on the Turbo Duo. I'll say one thing, a year ago, you would never have expected to see this many scrolls on a Turbo game. This is an above average shooter with some extra features such as multiple power-ups and the ability to turn around when you reach a boss. It's a good addition to the Turbo library. Number 25, Ranma 1 Half Hard Battle on the Super Nintendo. Ranma 1 Half is a great fighting game in the Street Fighter 2 tradition with great control and all the signature moves and then some. But I said it once and I'll say it again. I don't like cute games. In a fighting game, I want to hammer some goons, not twirl my ribbons. Number 24, Ninja Gaiden on the Turbo Duo. It's about time somebody did an upgrade to those great NES titles and Ninja Gaiden comes off well. There's loads of colors and details plus all the intermissions. A must for all you ninja gamers. Number 23, The Great Battle 2 Last Fighter Twin on Super Nintendo. Last Fighter Twin may not be for everyone, but I've got a soft spot for Gundams. Last Fighter Twin is a unique fighting game with the addition of the Gundams and their magical powers. The backgrounds in this game are excellent, as are the graphics and playability. I like it. Number 22, Gods on the Genesis. Gods combines a great challenge and excellent graphics and sound. Both the characters and the enemies animate smoothly and are highly detailed. Although Gods is a bit difficult, it's definitely worth your time to finish. Recommended. Number 21, Newtopia 2 on the Turbo Duo. Following in the steps of Part 1, the 6 meg version of Newtopia has all the same ingredients with better graphics, music, and a longer quest. If you liked Part 1, then you'll love Part 2. I'd love to see this version on CD. Utopia 3? Number 20, Magical Troll on the Genesis. This game may never appear in the United States, and that's a shame. Anyone who likes Super Mario type platform action games will love this game. It rates up there with the best of the big ones. Way cool characters and the biggest boss yet. Good stuff. Number 19, Outrun Europa on the Game Gear. The action is fast-paced and diverse, and the control is great! Hopefully, the first in a long line of quality second-generation Game Gear carts. Joanna Daniels, listen up. It's your closest, dearest, best friend, Joe. You're going great. At West Her, the salesman doesn't just make you a deal, he makes you a lifetime commitment. Newlywed Hyatt said she's glad she interrupted her honeymoon. I like the pictures in it. They don't offend me, and I'm not embarrassed by them. I'm not shocked by them either. One of the things that I love about the early issues of Die Hard Game Fan is how it was clearly not laid out by anybody with any actual magazine experience. It felt like a fanzine that somehow, against all odds, found a way to get distributed nationally. It was punk rock, especially when compared to the AM gold you got over at EGM and Game Pro. For the most part, the inexperience was endearing, giving them a personality that you didn't find with other publications. However, there were definitely times when that inexperience left my eyes hurting. For example, I dare you to read this preview of Gods. Between the yellow text and the brick background, this write-up, oh man, it's, it's impossible to read. Another good example of this is the Wonder Dog preview, which keeps the yellow text, but swaps out the bricks for a bright blue background. It's easier to make out the words, I'll give it that much, but don't stare at it for too long or it's gonna burn into your eyes. It's just terrible. So is this Ranma one half feature. The good news is that it switches to red text, but to say that that doesn't mix with the pale background is a gross understatement. You really have to squint and focus hard to make out what's being said here. Boy, even that pro tip only gets you so far. And that leaves us with this very first installment of Other Stuff, Game Fan's monthly gossip and rumors column. The green and black text isn't that hard to read, but things get a little dicey when you get close to that white glow in the middle of the page. Of course, none of this is helped by the lack of paragraphs. 
is just one big wall of text with a glowing speed bump in the middle of the page. Ugh, reading a magazine shouldn't be this difficult. And we're back with number 18, Phalanx on the Super Nintendo. Obviously, many have judged this game without beating it. Remember the rotating tunnel in Castlevania? It's here! At the end, Phalanx is a great shooter, probably too hard for most, but hey, there's always slow motion. Grab an ASCII pad and check out Phalanx. Number 17, Atomic Robo Kid on the Turbo Duo. This little-known classic arcade title has gone over really well on the PC Engine and is a favorite among the staff at GameFan. A great shooter and a really cool character. RoboKid has enough appeal to make it stand out from the rest. Number 16, Biohazard Battle on the Genesis. This is an amazing shooter like I've never seen before. Biohazard is a really unique game with incredible graphics and gameplay. Some of the enemies look like they're done in claymation. You can tell this is quality all the way. My only complaint is that it might be a little too difficult. Number 15, Kung Food on the Lynx. Whoa, mutant food monsters. Finally, another great Lynx game. Kung Food has big characters and controls great. Some of the characters are a crack up. The graphics are detailed and well shaded, and there's even a little scaling. A definite must -ola for Lynx fans. Number 14, Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge on the Super Nintendo. I really like the way X-Men is laid out. The characters are small and well animated, making the levels seem huge and cavernous, and the gameplay is right on. I also like controlling four different characters in one game. Another excellent Super NES game with outstanding music. Number 13, Out of This World on the Super Nintendo. Another unique game comes to the Super Nintendo translated perfectly from the PC. Out of This World is the thinking man's action game. With smooth polygons and memorable music, Out of This World is sure to be a classic. Number 12, World Heroes on the Neo Geo. What I like about World Heroes is that it's not just another Street Fighter II clone. The moves and characters are all new and unique, and I really like the weapons and added deathmatch. More awesome stuff for the Neo Geo. But, uh, where's my RPG? Number 11, Alien 3 on the Genesis. I haven't had this much fun being frustrated in a long time. This game requires good reflexes, a sharp memory, and a cast iron stomach, because if you can't rescue the hostages in time, they get chunked. Definitely a great action game you'll go back to over and over. Number 10, Gate of Thunder on the Turbo Duo. Now this is my kind of shooter. Gate of Thunder has it all, packed on one Super CD. Right from the start, you can see the quality of this game, with a totally cool intro plus some truly great headbanging music. All the explosions are sampled and the action is intense. Number 9, Global Gladiators on the Genesis. Way to go, Virgin! Where have you guys been? With games like this, Sega could be number 1. Global Gladiators is the best platform action game I've played since Sonic, with eye-popping graphics and some great music. Third generation all the way! Number 8, Prince of Persia on the Super Nintendo. Okay, Prince of Persia on the Super Nintendo. You might think, seen it, done it. NOT! This game is all new and unique. Even if you've played every version imaginable, you'll find this one is the best so far. Incredible animation and a great soundtrack add to the enjoyment of this game. Number 7, Soul Blazer on the Super Nintendo. Take the music and graphic excellence of Act Razor and throw it into an action RPG and you've got magic. Soul Blazer is a must whether you're into RPGs or not rivaling even the mighty Link. But uh, isn't it time for Act Razor 2? Number six, Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo. What a completely awesome game. JVC and LucasArts sure know how to program. Just wait until you see the incredible Mode 7 scenes. They'll make you dizzy and you'll be blown away by the music. Super Star Wars is awesome. 
Number 5. Thunderstorm FX on the Sega CD A must-have for Sega CD owners. Though it is the first in the Laserdisc to CD lineup, Thunderstorm loses little in the translation. It's like a roller coaster ride. I guarantee you'll play it over and over again. Oh yeah, to get the surround sound, use headphones. A big winner. Number 4. Super Double Dragon on the Super Nintendo This is an incredible fighting game that lives up to Streets of Rage fame. The amount of details and the moves in this game are seriously outstanding. Throw in a two-player option plus 16-bit versions of Double Dragon tunes and you've got an awesome game. Number 3. Thunder Force 4 on the Genesis This is the ultimate shooter. I've never played a shooter on the Genesis that even comes close to this. You'll be amazed at everything and the music kicks butt. Go see a doctor if you pass on this one. Number 2. Baseball Stars 2 on the Neo Geo this game is pure baseball excellence. I can't find one thing wrong with it. The graphics are incredibly well detailed with humongous players and the gameplay is unparalleled. Baseball Stars 2 is a major improvement over the first. All in all, the best. And here we are at Die Hard Game Fan's best reviewed game of October 1992. Wonder Dog on the Sega CD. Sega CD owners will be in heaven when Wonder Dog shows up. This game is a must-have and a good reason to buy a CD-ROM. It's got awesome music and graphics from beginning to end and some really kooky characters. I was up all night. Homer will be proud. Because fruits have big egos, they're not really team players. Each one wants to be the dominant flavor. Hey! But this country's not coming apart at the seams, for heaven's sakes. We're the United States of America. So aside from having him on the cover with Mario, Sonic, and Bonk, the Monitor is nowhere to be found in this debut episode of Die Hard Game Fan. It actually took four issues before Game Fan's mascot turned into a full-fledged comic book character. This issue is also lacking the Monitor's psychotic sidekick, the Postmeister, who will eventually take over the letter section. However, while it may be missing some of the most iconic characters, this issue does have an interview with Yuzo Koshiro, who composed the music to everything from Streets of Rage to Act Razor to Easebook 1 and 2. We learn that he played in a Sex Pistols style punk band in school, loves Van Halen, and can't get enough of Street Fighter 2, which he, of course, did not work on. Oh my god. <laughs> this is like really X-rated. Double X. Triple X. <laughs> and now, a peaceful moment brought to you by Die Hard Game Fan. During my four days of playing Wonder Dog, it's long. I was a happy guy. I awoke each morning with my password in hand and leapt out of the bed without even hitting the snooze button once. Hey, thanks for watching this debut episode of Die Hard Game Fan's Best and Worst. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and please let me know what you think, good and bad. We're going to be going through 87 more of these episodes together, so I want to make sure these episodes are as good as possible. Now, here's the question I have for you. Do you like cute games? Oh boy, the guy at Game Fan sure didn't. I wonder if that's going to be a reoccurring trend. I guess we'll find out next week. In other news, we'll be back later this week with the newest retro games hitting the PS Plus subscription. Followed by reviews and a whole bunch. Followed by reviews and more. While you wait for that, I strongly recommend you click that subscribe button and support what we're doing here. Until then.